Thank you, Helen. If I'd known uh, you were going to suggest this, I'd have put you on last so that uh, you went homesick rather than listening to my talk and feeling it. Right, let me see if uh, this works. No. Oh. Good. We're always beaten by technology on New Scientist. We write about it and we understand it, but we can't use it. Uh, so this talk uh, is uh, com uh, composed from two essays uh, in the book uh, by two professors, Paul Davies from Tempe uh, in uh, Arizona and Per Eklund, who uh, is from Linköping uh, in Sweden. So I'm going to try and take you on a, a bit of a road trip through history. Um, it's mostly about plumbing, so don't get your hopes up too much. Um, I want to start with the definition, a vacuum. What's a vacuum? A vacuum is a space with nothing in it. It's an idea we're all familiar with today. You get your coffee from a vacuum pack, uh, you clean your house with a vacuum cleaner, and if you fly in an airline, uh, or certainly if you go into space, we know you'll be travelling uh, through a partial vacuum. But it wasn't always that way. Uh, indeed, for a long time, it was fiercely believed that a, a vacuum could not possibly exist. Uh, and the reason why is here. This is Aristotle. Uh, he used several reasons to back up his contention. Uh, for example, everything in the universe was made, uh, according to him, of the four elements, earth, water, air, and fire. The vacuum was made of, well, nothing. Uh, therefore, it could not exist. Now, his view had a massive impact. It was the dominant view in ancient Greek times, uh, but it actually held sway for something like 2,000 years. Um, he was undoubtedly a very smart guy, uh, but he had the advantage that his ideas gained uh, longevity uh, by being adopted by the early church, and uh, they became art articles of faith. Uh, he's responsible not only for the notion that the vacuum doesn't exist, but also that the Earth sits at the center of the universe, uh, the idea that got Galileo into so much trouble. So let me jump forward by 2,000 years uh, to two years after Galileo's death to meet one of his former assistants. So this chap is uh, Evangelista Torricelli. Um, and this, on the left-hand side, notice it's written in Italian, you know, because it's genuine. I got it off the web. Um, uh, and this is the, uh, the experiment which history tells us made the first vacuum. Uh, so how does the experiment work? Well, it's a, it's a meter-long tube uh, filled with uh, mercury, and there's a mercury bath at the bottom. And uh, his, uh, Torricelli's assistant, Viviani, filled it with, with mercury, put the test tube into the bath, took his finger away, and what happened? But the, the height of the mercury column fell to 76 centimetres. And the interesting question was, what's above it? And what was above it is indeed a vacuum. Now, it's not a perfect vacuum, the sort of thing which Aristotle didn't like, uh, but it was nevertheless a vacuum. Uh, and I just want to point out here, you can see the 76 centimetre figure there. Each one of those centimetres was called a tor, T-O-R-R, and atmospheric pressure is 76 tor. Uh, the tor is still used today by vacuum scientists, and, and you're going to see them on a graph a bit later. Now, curiously enough, it was difficult to conduct any more of this research in Italy. The Pope in Rome was not keen on new ideas that challenged its dogma. So experimentation continued in Northern Europe, uh, where there was um, uh, a larger number of Protestants, and also in France, where at the time there was a second Pope who looked more favorably on enlightened thinking. So this device is also a, a uh, barometer it will tell you how the pressure is doing, the atmospheric pressure is doing. And the famous French scientist Blaise Pascal uh, used it as a barometer for the first time. He also sent his brother-in-law up the Puy de Dome, which is uh, an extinct volcano in the Massif Central in France, uh, with this device. And he was told to take measurements of the height of the column of mercury as he walked up the mountain. And sure enough, he found that the higher he went, the lower the column of mercury. Uh, and so this was, in a sense, the first altimeter ever made. Uh, and what it did was it, it made the idea of atmospheric pressure well and truly 
firm, concrete, it was well established. Now, a few years after this, we moved to Germany, where a chap called Otto von Goerike uh, created the first air pump and became a, a celebrity. That's his face on a, an old East German stamper on the left-hand side. Uh, what he did to begin with was he used a water pump in reverse. He would fill a barrel or a, or a sphere with water, pump out the water, and you'd get left with, uh, with, a, with a vacuum. But he, he, he persevered to try and make an air pump, which he did in uh, about 18, uh, 1650, um, and um, he actually collapsed one of these spheres. He, he, he pumped out so much uh, air that, that it collapsed. He made some uh, stronger ones. Uh, but it's a bit like a bicycle pump in reverse, which is what he did. But he was also uh, a showman. He was very eager to show that the vacuum did exist. So he made these two objects at the top there, which is called, they are called the Magdeburg spheres, hemispheres. And he put them together, pumped out the air, and then he used horses to try and pull them to, uh, apart. And they couldn't. And that was his idea for showing the power of the vacuum. Meanwhile, in London, Robert Boyle and Robert Hooke, two uh, new members, uh, new members of the new Royal Society here in London, uh, saw von Gurica's work and tried to improve his pump. This is a, 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 a plate from the time, and this is the version that's in the uh, Science Museum. Uh, and what they did was, uh, rather than use a piston pumping in and out, they, they put a rack and pinion on it, and basically you could, you could pull down the piston, close a, a valve, push the piston back up, open it again, pull it down, and it became, much, uh, it became much easier to use. They reached a pressure of about six torr, which is just over one-tenth of atmospheric pressure. Now, the funny thing here is that nobody knew what to do with a vacuum. Um, and for 200 years, the pressure that you could achieve using modern technology moved very, very little indeed. Um, nobody had a clue what to do with it. Nobody had a reason to do it. And the, the great exhibition in 1981, there was a competition, and the uh, maximum pressure achieved was 0.5 torr, not very big at all. But then things changed big time. So I'm just going to talk to you now very briefly about some of the extraordinary ideas that people had for making, uh, for, for ridding uh, chambers of, of air. And there were some really uh, intriguing ideas. So our first genius is Hermann Sprengel, uh, another German. Uh, he was a chemist, but also a, a brilliant uh, engineer. So what he did was he used mercury. The, the black stuff in these pipes are, are, are mercury. These, this is a capillary tube here, and this is a capillary tube coming down here. Uh, and what he does is he allows droplets of mercury to fall through this flask B. And as, as they fall, they trap little bubbles of air in between them. Now, you might think, you know, that's a pretty lame kind of idea. But this turned out to be an incredibly... Uh, impressive idea. In 1873, he reached one thousandth of a tor, which is not far off one thousandth of atmospheric pressure. Now, the question is, what changed? Why had nobody done anything for 200 years and suddenly everybody's piling in to make new, new pumps? And there's one word that explains it, and that is electricity. Scientists were eager to try electricity on anything and everything. And they wanted to pass it through various gases. And in order to do this, they needed to evacuate tubes. And Sprengel's pump was absolutely instrumental in making this happen. Of course, they found all sorts of weird glowing lights. Um, and there was something called cathode rays, which sounded really exciting. And of course, in 1898, that led to J.J. Thompson's discovery of the electron. But he wasn't the only one using uh, these, these evacuated tubes. Wilhelm Röntgen used vacuum tubes to create the first X-rays. Heinrich Hertz used them uh, in his discovery of the photoelectric effect. And of course, altogether, these experiments enhanced the growing notion that all matter, uh, including rarefied gases, uh, is made up of atoms and molecules. So this was the foundation of, of, of another, in fact, several, as it turned out, new branches of science. So the other driver to progress, 
the other driver to try and uh, 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 make better vacuums, uh, came from industry. So around this time, Thomas Edison wanted to make light bulbs very quickly. Now, the filament in his bulbs simply burned up in air. He used all sorts of things, human hair and all sorts of... He, gave all, he tried all sorts of things. Uh, but what he needed to do was to get rid of the air and, and, and pass the electric current through the filament in a vacuum. That way they didn't burn up. Um, and so what he wanted was a very fast and reliable way to make vacuums. And the man who supplied it was this chap here, Wolfgang Gaeda. Uh, this is his uh, mercury pump, a rotary mercury pump in uh, uh, 1905. He created this. The beauty of this is that it worked on a rot rotation and you could put it on a shaft, which meant it could be driven by a machine. And what he's done, which was really smart, is these are the capillary tubes that you saw in Sprengel's pump, but he's just wrapped them around a cylinder. And, but it works in almost exactly the same way, by creating small bubbles of air in mercury. But he didn't stop there. In about uh, 1918, uh, 1914, he, he created what, what's called a, a diffusion pump. Completely wrong name, but, but, but I'll, we'll stick with it for now. He used mercury, not pump oil, uh, but this is a great uh, uh, um, uh, diagram, so I thought I'd stick with it. So he would heat mercury and make mercury vapour. The mercury vapour would, would go up this tube, hit the baffles here, and fall down, and basically push molecules or atoms of air into the port where there was a backing pump, a secondary pump, which, which got rid of the stuff. Now, this is... It's called a diffusion pump, but it's actually um, it, it's a moment, momentum transfer pump. And what he's doing, essentially, is playing molecular billiards. He's pushing uh, these, these atoms out of, uh, out of the uh, vacuum chamber. Now, he reached an astonishing 10 to the minus 8 tor. That's 100,000 millionths of atmospheric pressure. And this device is still in use today, um, but with oil rather than mercury for obvious reasons. Now, there is now a pause. So here's Gaynor's diffusion pump here. Uh, but the pause is while Europe beats itself up and tries to destroy itself in two world wars. Um, and you can see that the action starts again uh, after the Second World War uh, when, again, there is a drive to higher vacuums. And this comes from the... Um, nuclear work being done in the USA and uh, Russia and, uh, and the UK, France and China, uh, but also uh, civilian nuclear power as well. Uh, and it also comes from international scientific collaborations that start, uh, things like CERN uh, that we know about today. Uh, and these drove us to higher vacuums. This was one of the first devices to be created after the war. It's called a turbo-molecular pump, a turbo, as, as scientists call it. And, and if, if the last pump I showed you was about atomic billiards, this one is about cricket. Essentially, these, these veins here, these, uh, these blades, rotate so quickly, they literally smash the molecules into a backing pump, uh, similar to the one you saw before. So this is real, you know, sort of, this is real bully boy stuff, getting rid of your gas. So all the pumps I've talked about so far um, are about removing gas from a vacuum chamber. But in the 1970s, a new idea emerged. What you can't get rid of, just stick to the side of the chamber. Um, an Italian chap called Cristoforo Benvenuti was at the centre of all this. He worked at CERN and developed a sticky film, uh, which he called a getter. Uh, it's like flypaper for lonely gas particles. And, and this is a, a picture of the LEP, the Large Electron Positron Collider, which is the forerunner to the Large Hadron Collider. It, it lives in the same tube, but it was a different, uh, a different device in, in the middle. And, and that had 22 kilometres of getter in it to try and uh, get an even higher vacuum in the beam line uh, than existed. Um, now, that's not the best of these pumps. Benvenuti also pioneered a, a method used in, in the LHC, so same tunnel, tunnel different, uh, different tube in the middle. Uh, this is the LHC. And 
he, uh, Benvenuti came up with the idea of cryopumping, in which you freeze any stray particles to the walls of the chamber. And this helps the LHC beam line down to about 10 to the minus 12 tor. That's 100 million millionths of an atmosphere. 10 to the minus 14 atmospheres, which is colossal. But we're not quite finished yet. The last note at the bottom here is called alpha. Now, alpha... Um, is an experiment at CERN uh, which is used to confine antimatter. When antimatter comes into contact with matter, they annihilate one, one another. Um, now, the fact that CERN scientists can now keep antimatter in a vacuum for a long period of time seems to suggest that we're actually getting very, very close to the perfect vacuum. It's not 10 to the minus 6, of course, at 16 it should be 0. Uh, tour, but, but it may be that we're near as damn it there. Um, now, you might think, end of the graph, that's the end of the story, uh, but actually, I have one last point to make. The vacuum I've talked about so far is what, what would be termed a, a classical vacuum. That's a, a box with nothing inside it. But in the past 80 years, as you heard from Marcus, quantum physics has told us that even the emptiest of empty spaces is seething with energy, with electromagnetic fluctuations. And in quantum physics, electromagnetic fluctuations are synonymous with particles. So the dominant view today is that even the highest vacuums will still be filled with virtual particles popping into and out of existence. There are problems with that particular... Um, uh, viewpoint, as Marcus pointed out, but that is still the dominant view. So, hence, I've, re I've brought back Aristotle. His reasoning was way off, but perhaps he was right all along. Nowhere in the universe is there a truly empty space. Thank you. <laughs>